I want to talk to you today about a couple of dreams that I had. I spent probably 15 minutes in the first service explaining that we know dreams and visions are not equal to Scripture. We know that. I just felt like it was a need. I, I'm not going to take time to do that today uh, in this service. But I, I do want you to know that wh while I'm going to talk about two or three dreams today, I know that we don't base our theology on dreams. We don't base our, uh, our faith on dreams. But we know that God is uh, he's a dream giver. He's a vision giver. He speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, whenever Peter, Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Um, uh, that was Peter's response. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. And a lot of times we think that was just Simon's promotion. You know, he was promotion, promoted or has a special anointing because he got the answer right. But Jesus tells us why he was blessed. He said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because it's not flesh and blood that figured this out. The Holy Spirit, my Father in heaven, they revealed this to you. And Jesus was saying, Peter, you are blessed because you're learning lesson one of the kingdom. And that is this, all truth comes from God. It's not our uh, cogitations it's not our calculations. It's not our conceptions. But everything that is true comes through one way or another from the Holy Spirit. He said, you are a blessed man because you're down the right road here. You understand that all truth has to come from the Father. Jesus spoke. Uh, so he was thereby saying, you know, you, you, you will have the word. But also remember, God will speak to you. God will communicate with you. I think it was Tertullian uh, uh, about uh, 1,800 years ago or so that when people began to say the Spirit doesn't speak anymore, we have the book, you know, we have the Bible. Tertullian, I believe it was, said, when were we able to put the Holy Spirit in a book and lock him in a book? Now, nobody, you know, believed in the inspiration of Scripture more than those guys. He wasn't doubting that. He said, just because God has given us the book doesn't mean he doesn't speak. But we know that we don't base our doctrine on dreams and visions. And I'm troubled when people go to the prophet's website to see what he or she has got to say before they open their Bible to have a devotion every day. But at the same time, when the church was born and the day of Pentecost, uh, which is coming up, uh, on the day of Pentecost, there was a great utterance made from the book of Joel brought forward to the New Testament. It shall come to pass in the last days, says the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will receive dreams. Your young men will see visions on handmaids, on servants, on the, on the down and out and the uh, uh, upper crust and the lower crust. He said all of the people of God are going to be able to hear from the Lord and we have this more uh, certain, more sure word of truth, word of faith, which is the written word. So that's what we live by is the written word. But the written word was never given to us to keep us from having dreams and visions and hearing the Lord. Uh, God has not ceased his miraculous power just because we've got the New Testament. We still see through a glass darkly. <clears throat> now the day is coming when we won't need that, but it's not here yet. Uh, as long as we see through a glass darkly. But I want to talk to you about these dreams. You know what I just said? I wasn't going to do what I did for a service. I think I just did it. Um, I want to speak particularly of my concern for our, for our children. Um, and I don't mean, hey, there's, there's junk going on over in children's church. You need to get your kids out of there. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about in this society. I'm talking about around the world. I think we have been lulled into a sense of everything's going to be okay. I think part of it is we live in a, in, a, in a place in the country that 
feels relatively safe. We, we have a mindset in our state that is basically a, goes back to biblical roots, or at least a lot of times we do. And we remember some things that a lot of places have forgotten. But I think, while I thank God for that, I know, num- I know two things. Number one, not everybody has that mindset. And number two, that can lull us into a sense of everything's okay when it's not okay. You say, Pastor, you sound like an alarmist. Well, I, I am an alarmist in the sense that I'm a watchman. And watchmen were to sound the alarm when there was something that an alarm needed to be sounded over. I don't want you moms to go home and not have lunch today or go out and have lunch today. Um, This is not an indictment of failure. In fact, I, I am looking at a congregation right now and in my mind's eye, I'm looking out on those that are live streaming and in Brown Chapel. And I'm looking at a a group of people that, as far as I'm concerned, are the greatest parents on planet Earth. Um, I believe in you. This is not an indictment saying we have failed. I'm I'm saying to you that there is a failure in society. There's a failure around us. And the work of the enemy, if he can't distort our view of family, if he can't distort our view of human sexuality. He at least wants to desensitize us so that we say, well, it's no big deal. We've been through hard times before. We've been through difficulties before. And I think that we are standing on a wall watching an enemy approach. And my concern is that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the most part, is not concerned over what they see. I said, we're not concerned over what We see, I want you to know that there is a target painted on the backs of our children. Um, The enemy wants to disinherit them. He wants to defile them. He wants to destroy them. And moms and dads, he wants to distract from the real battle. A few years ago, and I'm going to say one other thing, and this is not a popular thing to say because there's such a feminist mood uh, uh, movement Um, And boy, I tell you, anytime a group has been mistreated, it's a good thing to have a response to the mistreatment. But we've got to be careful that our response to the mistreatment isn't a mistreatment of the mistreatment or mistreaters. It's a, you know, it's, it's like a grandfather clock. You see those massive grandfather clocks. And I'm just amazed that they just keep on as long as you keep them wound. They just keep on doing. And Somebody explained to me in a clock shop one time. In fact, it was in the Ten Boom clock shop in, in Harlem, uh, Amsterdam. They said, you know, the, the, the thing about a clock is that you have to keep it in balance. He said, you do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to put this in, you have to put this, you have to keep this lubricated. He said, but the, the funny thing about it is you do all of that so that it will be in balance for about three quarters of a second at a time. Then it goes out of balance, but it comes back into balance. So our lives are like that. I I haven't lost you, have I? Okay. Balance is something that you can't just push a button and you're balanced. Balance is something that you have to work at. Balance is something that requires openness to the move of the spirit or else we can become imbalanced very, very easily. Now, I want to say this. I'm also concerned uh, for not only for our children, I'm especially concerned for our women. Um, I, I, and what I mean by women is I think there is as much barbarity in human trafficking today as we saw in our country in slavery. And in some places around the world, it's worse than it is here. But I think the big unspoken plague in America is human trafficking. It affects our children, boys and girls, and it affects especially women that are in their late teens or or, or early years and sometimes older. Loved ones, we've got to understand things are not right. There are sick people that are in our midst 
And I, when I say we have to stand up, I don't mean go buy a gun. I don't mean declare civil war. I don't mean, you know, start a neighborhood militia. That's not what I'm talking about. But we as the people of God need to take this to the Lord in sincere prayer. We need to understand it does matter how you vote. It does matter how you live. But more than any of that, it matters how you pray. Some things happen, Dick Eastman says. Some things happen when I pray. You see now why I only got past the verse? Okay. Uh, we're, we're on track. You know, we're on track to go nowhere except just stay right here. Um, Dick Eastman said, some things happen when I pray that may not happen if I don't pray. Now, there are some things God does not because we pray, but whether or not we pray. He is so good. Just like you as a parent, there are some things you'll do for your children, whether or not you ask them, you know, you're not going to send a kid to bed hungry and because your kids, you know, didn't ask for supper. I mean, you're going to give them supper whether they ask for it or not. That's part of your process. That's part of your care. Some things God does because it's part of our care, but there are other things that God does because we ask and it's part of his plan to integrate us into what he wants to do. But loved ones, we need to understand that some things happen when we pray that might not happen if we don't pray. Therefore, if we do not pray as we ought to pray, then something in my life or something in the life of those I love will probably or at least possibly go undone. The great sin of not praying is not that you lose your merit badge, you know, your folded hands merit badge. The great problem with not praying is that God, who has by design, by design, incorporated us to be part of the plan, goes undone. And I pray because I love the Lord. I pray because I need prayer. But loved ones, one of the strongest motivations for me is I pray because I love you. I pray because I love my children. I pray because I love my wife. You see, <clears throat> the more I pray, as, as my pastor used to put it, you just say it's coincidence. He said, all I know is the more I pray, the more coincidences there are. <laughs> Some things happen when we pray that don't happen when we do not pray. And we are seeing an uptick in human trafficking. And we need to do spiritual warfare over our teens and over our children and over our young ladies. And, uh, you know, every time I say something like that, somebody will end up saying, you oh, I, I don't, I, I, I don't, don't tell me I'm weak. I don't need a man in my life. Well, uh, you know, I don't need anything. Well, I know of a couple of things you need, starting with a better attitude. Uh, <laughs> but that's another sermon for somebody else to preach. And by the way, if you're watching online, this is your first time with us. Thank you for visiting. My name is Corey. And uh, Corey Henderson. And I really, really believe strongly what I'm saying, okay? Um, loved ones, I want to tell you, the feminist movement has created a society where men are afraid to be men where men feel like they're lessening their wives if they say, honey, I'm here to take care of you. Uh, I remember walking down the street one time and um, we had all our family and mom was on the outside. I moved her to the inside. I stood on the outside. Daddy said, uh, or, or I think it was Molly said to, to Jeremy, why does daddy always do that? You know, why does daddy always stand on the outside? And Jeremy sounded like Ron Swanson giving an old tour guide <laughs> He, because I'd explained it to him so many times. He said, well, Molly, in the old days, <laughs> the man would stand on the outside in case a, a carriage came by and splashed mud, it would get on the man and not on the woman. And he said, he, that was not really important, but here's the big thing. He said, I've seen my daddy do this because he's taking care of my mama. And he taught that to his little sister. And, and we do things that are outdated 
because we believe in the root principle of it. Man, you, you men need to step up and be the fathers you were meant to be. And you women, you don't need to step down. You need to step up and be the women that you were intended to be. I don't believe there are limitations. I don't believe women are less. I just, I, in fact, women are probably better, but um, uh, I don't believe women are less, but I do believe women are different. And, and, and that's, that's not a fall on your sword issue. I'm not, I don't want my husband to walk on the outside. That's, your, that's between you and your husband. Just when that truck comes by, don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> but I, you say, well, that's just so old fashioned. Well, the problem is not whether or not we walk down the sidewalk a certain way. The problem is that there are no boundaries of care that God put in place. And, uh, you know, God spoke in a couple of places, and it's really a, a, a staggering wake-up call. God understood that Israel didn't understand that he would never leave them. He would never forsake them. He would never stop loving them. And this is the way he couched it. He said, can a mother... Forget her nursing child? Can a father forget his son that he carries upon his shoulders? See, he was saying something that ought to be the most obvious no in all the world. But we have evolved into a society where mothers and fathers don't always fulfill the godly role. And I think the Holy Spirit looking ahead said, can you, can you envision that happening? Well, yeah, it happens all the time. He said, but even if it does happen, he was speaking the unthinkable. He said, even if a mother forgets her nursing child, even if a father forgets the boy that he carried on his shoulders, he said, the system may break down, God says, but I will never do that to you. And that's both a mega encouragement and a mega terror to think that the safest place a child would have would become the most dangerous place that a child would have. So we've got to understand that being a Christian that's committed to God's order for the family, you've got to come to grips. We, we've tried, to, we've, we've tried to, to not be harsh, but you've got to deal with this thing about abortion. You, you've got to understand that we are pro-life enthusiastically and unapologetically, and we don't owe a platform for those that want to argue that case. We don't, we don't owe it and we don't give it. And loved ones, I'm telling you, we are in an age where we are being deceived into thinking that everything's all right. And we're losing our foundation. And we're losing um, security for our children. Abraham Lincoln said something, then I'm going to share the first dream with you. You say, were you there when he said it? No. He said, the combine, all the combined armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa could not by force make a track on the Blue Ridge or take a drink from the Ohio. I forget the context of this. I was, I'm thinking that he was talking about how we need to, needed to press through and remove slavery from our heritage and from our culture. He said, all the armies of Africa, Asia, and Europe combined could not by force take a track on the blue, make a track on the Blue Ridge Mountains or take a drink from the Ohio River. He said, but if we fall, if we ever cease to be a nation, it will rise up not from out there, but from in here, from our own hearts. It must come from within. I was in late first year, maybe, maybe the first half of the second year that I was pastor here, and I was working through some things. And I want to say this. Um, I said four. Really, it's, it's five. The, the Lord showed me in, during this period of time, it was about a six-month period of time, I didn't understand, but the Lord said there are five crises that you have to take this church through. 
uh, all five of them can, can lead to destruction if you don't lead the church through these things. Um, I've said four, and the more I've thought it out, it's really five, because one thing I've called one is, you say, what are they, Pastor? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it at a day yet to be declared. That's just so you'll keep coming every week to find out what they were. And I've, I, I, I saw one right away, and the other four I didn't see for many years, but they, they've, we've, we've encountered all five of them. And I believe we're winning the victory, but it's, it's been a tough fight. But this was the first thing. We were, as a church, maybe at that time we were a church of maybe 450, 500 people. We were still in, in uh, Brown Chapel when it was smaller. And um, <clears throat> we had decided to have a celebration. And we went out to a place like Saluda Shoals, uh, Saluda Park, rather. And, um, you know, where there were pavilions. And the parents and grandparents young couples, we were all seated in the pavilions and carrying on, no sin going on, nothing that I would be ashamed of or embarrassed to say this is my church, nothing that I would feel hesitant to do. Uh, but I saw everybody there and I was kind of standing off to the side uh, after leaving the pavilion because um, the, the surrounding territory was what we call in Florida, uh, we, we call it sawgrass. You know, uh, it, it's like you see a lot in Charleston where grass is growing up out of the water and it looks like ground, but uh, it's, it's really just literally grass that grows in water. The water could be six inches deep or six feet deep. Uh, you can't really tell. And I love watching that grass uh, when the wind's blowing, it is, it is just beautiful. It's relaxing. But I got up to go down because there was some kind of movement causing the grass to move. I knew it wasn't wind. Children had been playing in the water. All the children were sent off to a playground. And some of them kept getting near the water. But there were gators in the water. I know that. Being from Florida, anytime you see that grass, there's a good chance there are gators or something in there that you don't want to be around. So I told all the children, I said, no, 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 no. Get back and stay in, the, stay in the playground. And the parents were just, you know, talking, having a good time. Um, but I guess the herding instinct in a pastor is, you know, get, just get away from the water. And I remember thinking, these are the biggest roots I have ever walked on. They were huge root system, unnatural root system. And um, somebody had said, uh, you know, we know this is a safe and solid place to be. Look at how the roots are holding everything together. But I knew instinctively, I didn't understand all that was going on at the time, but I knew instinctively those roots weren't what they appeared to be. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that we were putting our trust in roots that weren't really roots. Okay. And um, everybody's carrying on having a good time, nothing wrong. But the children had been set to the side. And the people were giving testimonies. They were sharing prophecies. They were giving uh, reports on encounters with God. And everything was about this spirit-filled life and what it produced. And the children were put, were put uh, to the side. Feasting, fellowshipping. It was a sense of being safe. But as I looked down at those roots, I realized, uh, well, the first thing, out of the water, snakes began to, to crawl up. Hundreds and thousands of snakes just began to crawl out of the water. And some of the snakes that, that I saw were not native to South Carolina, so I was a little confused. But then I felt movement under my feet, and I looked, and those roots were becoming serpents. They were becoming snakes themselves. They weren't roots. They were serpents. And I knew by the time, well, let me just tell you what happened. As the serpents came up, I, I screamed for the parents to go get their children. Most did not respond. A few did. But there were three types of snakes. There were some that approached the children and swallowed them whole. Some of our children were swallowed whole by these snakes. Some of them, there were, uh, they were approached by constrictor types uh, of snakes, and they were wrapped up by the snakes and crushed 
so that they could not breathe. The life crushed out of them. You could hear bones crunching. And then some were attacked by snakes and they were bitten. They weren't swallowed. They weren't crushed. But they were injected with uh, toxins and with venom that would mutilate them and scar them for the rest of their life if they survived at all. And I'm, I'm like, I'm in this panic. And I say, we've got to get the children. We've got to move the children. And those that had not moved already were just, they were kind of dumbstruck. Some began to blame South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. Some began to blame the church for having a picnic at that place in the first place. Some said, if you had taken care of my child better in Sunday school, this wouldn't have happened. And it was just utter and total chaos. And at that moment, the Lord began to speak to me. And he, I'm giving you as condensed a version as I can. He said, the church is in danger of thinking they've given a foundation that they've gotten their children rooted and the children are not rooted. They think they're rooted, but what the children understand as roots are toxic. They're poisonous. They will, uh, like their father, they will come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And the Lord spoke to me and said, a generation will be lost unless you meet this first crisis. And I don't have time to go into the details, but he said there are other crises. He didn't identify them, but he told me there would be several. I believe there are five. He said, this is the first crisis, and this is the first thing the devil will do to distract you from your destiny and from your legacy and from your heritage. He wants to cause parents to be disinterested and be distracted, while in the children he wants to defile he wants to destroy. He wants to, um, um, oh, there was another word. Um, I didn't write it down, but there was another word that was used. But he said that there is a target on the back of the children of this generation. Now, I woke up from that and I was awake for a pretty good while and I prayed. We talked to the board and that's when we began to take deliberate steps. They were only baby steps. But that's when we began to take deliberate steps to, to change uh, our focus toward children. Not away from anything, but more on children. And that doesn't mean we didn't have good children's ministries back then. Justin's a product of our children's ministry. I remember Dottie Hoos, who was a, child, uh, a teacher for our children. I remember my girls coming home and and Sister Dottie had taught him, you know, throw a, throw a kiss to Jesus. And my girls, when we'd get through praying, they'd go, mwah, mwah. And I loved it. There was, there was Sunday school. There were children. There was a good thing being done. The, the thing that changed wasn't in the church, although we did change some things. The thing that changed was the atmosphere where we were living it had become the domain of alligators and serpents. And parents were being lulled into thinking everything's fine. And loved ones, I want to tell you, our children in America are not fine. Uh, they, and I know there are teachers in the public school systems that are spirit-filled, anointed men and women of God. And not every, not every public school is... is is like some that we're concerned about. But I also want you to know the spirit of, uh, of some higher ups in education is not healthy. It's not for our children. There are some things that you and I need to wrestle to the ground, not literally, I'm not advocating rebellion, I'm not advocating violence, but I am saying that we need to become very aggressive in our prayers and we need to stop saying it'll be okay. It's not going to be okay unless we get it covered in prayer. There are targets painted on the backs of your children. There are targets painted on the back of our young girls and young men. There are targets painted on the back of some of our young women. And we need to stand up 
to human trafficking. We need to stand up to ungodly agendas just like we failed to do in, in 1861. We said it'll die out. We said it'll work out. We said this, that, and the other. We did everything when we were dealing with slavery except deal with slavery. Are, are you hearing me? We did everything to deal with slavery except deal with slavery. And it ended up bringing us into a war and a hundred years of, of, of racial hatred back and forth after the, uh, the last battle was fought. Uh, it, it wasn't all right. It didn't work out. And, and it, it, I know that that is a layered and complicated thing. There's more than just one issue. But what I'm trying to tell you is we, including this church, I don't think this church, but the Christian church in general is in danger of just thinking that we're one election away of everything being great. Now, I think elections make a difference. I think some of the problems we've had uh, in our history have been because of the consequences of elections. But I want to tell you something, loved ones. You and I, the enemy wants more than anything to lull us into the delusion to think that a change in the White House or a change in the governor's mansion is going to turn everything around and everything's going to be okay. There was a time when you had fringe left. There was a time when you had fringe right. But about 80% of the people in the middle were basically operating from the same principles, basically. Now, we, we, you, know, you know, now what we've got, instead of having about 80% that are in the middle, we've got about 8% that are in the middle. And this side will vote this way regardless. This side will vote this way regardless. And the future of our nation hinges on a single digit number of voters that are called independents. And we think that something's going to change with an election. I wish it were that easy. But what we find is that if I don't have the backing that I need as president to do this, that, or the other, I'll just issue an executive order. And then when the other side's elected, well, I'll undo the, the uh, um, executive order. Loved ones, we, we used to have so many exits and so many stop gaps that we could depend on to keep our uh, nation safe. And now we are a boiling cauldron. I'm not trying to say who's right and wrong. I mean, we all have opinions on who's right and wrong. And, and, and that's not a bad thing. But what I'm saying is we are being distracted from praying. We'll do everything but pray. We'll do everything except retake our biblical commands to be a father and to be a mother and to be grandparents. And we're, we're, we're literally giving away a generation and we're doing the same thing uh, aggressively through abortion and passively through a hands-off approach. We're doing the same thing that Israel said, did in the days of the Old Testament when they said it's so important for us to have food that we will appease the agricultural gods. And to appease the agricultural gods, I must offer my children to Moloch. And loved ones, I know we don't like that. I know we're uncomfortable with that. But I want to tell you, we have got to become a people who wake up and see what is happening. And we have to go aggressively against a world system while loving that world system into the kingdom. It's a very difficult thing to do. Now, <clears throat> that was a, a dream that I had. As I was praying um, about this, how to handle this, um, I, I, I felt like over the course of, of several weeks, actually months, I felt like the Lord dealing with me that I needed to share this. I didn't, I, I, I didn't want to, it, it's easy to be passionate about something and sound like you're fussing when you're preaching to the choir, you know. This is not a, you're doing wrong and you better straighten up. Now, if you're doing wrong, you better straighten up. 
But that's not what this message is. What this message is, is we are being desensitized to the threat. We are calling serpents lying in wait roots. We are calling fellowship and dwelling in unity which is good, we've, we've not understood that we've let down our guard for our children and for the coming generations. I had two dreams that I will tell you about in, in January of 2020. Um, one of them might have been, I'll have to look at my journal, it might have been the end of December, but before COVID rose to the surface in our country. And um, I was in a prison cell, and it wasn't like a super max with cable television. It was an old uh, bamboo dug out of the side of a hill prison cell, and I was in it. And outside of it, I was being guarded by a soldier, not an American soldier. I didn't tell this three years ago because I was so afraid that I would be misunderstood as being anti-Chinese. Um, and, and the staff said, or some of them said, Pastor, if you tell that, you're going to be misunderstood. You're going to sound xenophobic. You're going to sound like you're against the Chinese. Because I'd had three or four other dreams of conflict with us in Asia before this. And um, they said, I think it'd just be too easy to be misunderstood. So I prayed and I said, Lord, I'll wait. And the multitude of counselors, there's safety there's wisdom. I'll wait. But I went ahead and told them what I dreamed so it would be a matter of record. And it was a Chinese soldier. And I, I want to say this because I don't know who's listening. I, I have no animosity or no problem with Chinese people. Jesus loves all the people of the world and we better do the same thing. But I do have problems with the Chinese government and the communist dictates um, and I think that's what the soldier represented, not Chinese people. We've had Chinese people uh, here in our church, and they're deeply loved and cared for. Problems not with China, the problems with China's government. And um, I was a prisoner. I kept trying to say, why? Why am I a prisoner? Why am I a prisoner? What have I done? And, of course, there was very little communication because he didn't speak English. I didn't speak any Chinese. And... Um, wouldn't know where to start, you know. I, but I, it was obvious he couldn't give me any answers and I couldn't get any solutions. But I was there. I, 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 I couldn't get medicine. I couldn't get food except just some basic supplies. And it wasn't so much that they were trying to mistreat me in giving me this food. It was like all that was available. The supply line was, was hurt. The water I got was limited and not very pure. And I said, Lord, what's going on? And I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version, but the Spirit of the Lord began to speak. And he said uh, that this is the result of a nation forgetting who the Lord is. And he told some other things that some of you would think sound political, so I won't even go there. But um, he said, they've told me they don't want me in society. Or you, he said, you have told me you don't want me in your society. So I'm going to give you a taste of what it's like when I'm not in your society. And, and I want to tell you this. Um, Corey reminded me of this with something that he said a, a while back about something else. The Lord said, I'm not, I'm not removing my hand from you. He said, but I have lifted my hand. And he said, whether I have to do this, or, or whether I leave it here, or do this, will depend on how you respond. Now, you say, that doesn't sound like the Lord. Well, it sounds like exactly, exactly like Ezekiel. Yeah. Remember in Ezekiel, the Spirit of God was in the temple, and the Spirit of God went out of the temple proper, uh, to see what Israel would do. Then it went to the gates of the city and watched to see what Israel would do. And only after the third provocation did the Spirit of God depart Jerusalem. So he says, I want you to know, I, this is what happens when I lift my hand. Or, or he said, you're about to see what will happen when I just lift my hand. 
and then we've had 2020, 2021, 2022, um, right after that. He said, the, the implication was, this is where his hand is. If we're, if we're not careful, this will be where his hand is. And uh, I woke up and I, I, I was just like almost hyperventilating, covered in sweat. And, and you got to understand, it's the winter. And uh, I, I'm just, Lord, what, what do I do? What do I do? I understood what it meant. I, 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 I thought, well, I've got to tell the church. And then um, I felt like the Lord told me, not in the dream, but I felt like the Lord told me, you've been warning about this since 2008. You don't need to do any more warning. If people are going to do something, they will have done something. If they're not, they, will, they, they have not. And that, that was a scary thing to me. Is this, this is not about you rounding up the troops and telling them what you've seen. You've been telling them this for 12 years. And I, I, I didn't know what to do. And then it was either later that night when I went back to sleep or the next night. I, I can't remember. I have to look at my journal. But I had a second dream. The cell that I was in was there dug into the side of the hill. I was out now. And in the cell next to it was a woman that attends our church, a young mother with her young child. She was in there and her husband was doing everything he could to get them out, but he couldn't find a way to get them out. And I, I said, Lord, what, what does this mean? This, this guy's in a panic. I would, I would I'd, I'd jump on a circle saw if that could help him. He was doing his best to get his wife and child out of that cell. And he said that, uh, the, I felt that the Lord spoke to me and said, this is phase two. Phase two will be denial of needs for children and for women. And by women, he it was implying those that, uh, and I don't know how to say it, ladies, say it, those that might be weaker. He said, it's going to get worse and the helpless are the next target. And again, will I lift my hand off or will you pull my hand back down? And I, I understood when he said, you, 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 I understood it wasn't about me. I, I mean, I'm not perfect, but I haven't rejected the Lord. Uh, the, the Lord said, because America has hated children and because Americans have misused their women in pornography and made them objects, I'm going to show America what happens when their two greatest treasures are attacked. And I said, Lord, you, 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 you've got to help us. And from that time on, I've been praying for God to give us the ability to rebuild families, for daddies to come home, for mamas to come home, to, 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 to put the priority where it needs to be put. I'm not talking about quitting a job and coming home. That's something you've got to decide. That, that's, that's none of my business. I don't have a right to tell you if you ought to work in the home or outside the home. But I want to tell you, we need to repent for giving the care of our children to someone else. I'm going to talk about the rest of this next week. I promise next week will be better. Unless it's not. But I want to talk to you. I want to illustrate this a little bit further. We saw it in the time of Moses. We saw it when Israel sacrificed their children to Moloch. We saw it when there was murder um, that was taking place in a particular context we'll talk about next week. And then we want to go into Corinth and talk about the power. There is supernatural power that is unleashed when a parent loves their family. When a dad takes responsibility. And by the way, just to go ahead and answer some of your questions, you know, is, is woman to be subject to man, is woman to obey man? The Bible doesn't say that. It says that a woman should be subject to her husband. And a woman is subject to her husband because her husband loves her as Christ loved the church. 
You see, in any, any time a man doesn't love his wife <laughs> the way Christ loved the church, submission doesn't work. And any time, uh, we'll save it, but, <laughs> but I want to tell you, we, we are so busy pointing out the abuses, and there have been abuses since the beginning of time. Uh, in, in, any time we focus on correcting the abuses instead of going back to the original, we're going to get twisted up. We're going to get knotted up. We're going to talk about there is amazing power in a parent's love. That's what we'll talk about. And then I'll give you eight beginning steps on how to pray for your children. Okay, let, let, me, let me close it with this. Um, as I was praying and I said, Lord, help me, help me to know how to deal with this, Lord, when I feel something as passionately as I feel this, loved ones, it's easy for any pastor to, to say more than he should or to say it in a way that's not a good way to say it because he didn't plan to, out how to say it. Um, now, don't misunderstand me, you know, every once in a while, and, and people mean well, they mean it to be an encouragement. They say, don't ever apologize for the Word of God. Don't ever, don't ever be afraid to speak what God gives you. Uh, loved ones, it would never enter my mind remotely to apologize for the Word of God. I would never do that. That's not, that I don't even think that way. And, and um, it, it, I'm not afraid to share what God would ever tell me. That's not my issue. I am not afraid. But I do know this. I do know that if I don't speak under the anointing of the Spirit, I can do more harm than good. The word that is to give life can be a hammer. And I just want to say in this society especially, there's some lessons of civility that need to be relearned, starting on our roadways. I prophesy some of you will have a divine appointment <laughs> on the way to Mother's Day lunch today, and God will give you a chance to be nice <laughs> to somebody that doesn't deserve it. <laughs> no, you got to understand, God, God is going to, we think everything has gone to hell but hell always overplays its hand. And God is about to bring things under his kingdom. But he's not going to do it with a mad church. He's not going to do it with a mean church. I wish there was a religious way. I'd reprint the stickers. I, I wish there was a spiritual way to say mean people suck. I wish there was a <laughs> spiritual. I, we need to bring that bumper sticker back with that one word modified. I don't, I don't know. God, we're, it, it's, it feels like it's hopeless. But I want to tell you, if you let God tenderize you, if you let God tenderize you, if you will let God tenderize you, you can be you'll be amazed at what he's able to bring about through your hand. I know of a dad in this church that had exasperated himself, loved his son with all of his heart and wanted to help, but just didn't know what else to do. Boy, wasn't a bad boy. He just, and I got permission to share this, wasn't, wasn't a bad boy, just non-compliant. And the testimony is this. The boy said, my dad did everything that he could think of to do. And I just still kept pushing the limits, kept stepping over the line. And when asked, well, what did he do to rein you back in? It, it ended. That rebellion ended. What did he do to bring it back in? He said, one time I did something and my dad just on the way to school, he just cried all the way. Didn't say a word. He just cried, and I saw his broken heart. He said, and I decided I'm not going to live this way. I'm not going to do this. I believe that the world is waiting for a new church that will love our enemies and do good to those who harm us 
And we, we, we need to be strong in the Lord. We need to fight battles, but we need to let the Lord choose the battles. Well, as I was praying um, about, Lord, what, what do I share? What do I not share? Because you are so kind. You are so supportive. When I say it's a struggle, you'd say, oh, pastor, we trust you. We believe in you. Go ahead. You understand that that's not my struggle. My struggle is I want it to work. I want it to work. And um, I don't need to just vent every few weeks and do okay. I need to, to see, John put it this way. I have no greater joy than to see that my children are walking in truth. Any other motivation, you need to question the motivation of the shepherd. I have no greater joy than to know that my children are walking in the church. I said, Lord, what do I do? I've got these verses. I feel like you put these verses on my heart. But I don't know if you've given me these verses. Y'all bear with me. You'll understand. I don't know if you've given me these verses to help me understand what's going on. Or if you've given me these verses to proclaim to the church. I, I, I just don't know. What do I do? And I didn't get anything for several days. And then finally I, I went to the Lord. I, I said, uh, Lord, I'm going to ask you this way. Maybe, maybe I'm approaching this wrong. This is so big. Maybe I need to eat the elephant one bite at a time. Okay. So what is the one thing out of like eight pages of notes that I'd gotten out of prayer? What is the one thing that you want your people to understand there, there's, there are so many points here and every one of them could be their own sermon. What is the one thing that I can start with? What is the first bite that I take? Just one thing, just one thing. Then I began to feel something churn. I thought, okay, this is, this is what the Lord's trying to do. He's trying to move me to starting small and clarifying. And he took me to first Samuel when Saul was being coronated as king of Israel. Now, I had been reading that a few days earlier because uh, I want to give you a break. I, I want you to be, have a break from this present time. And I'm doing a four or five part thing on the life of King Saul in a few weeks just to, just to give you a break. Um, and uh, he took me to that verse and it was the passage where when Samuel was demonstrating, Samuel already knew, but Samuel was demonstrating who was to be the king with all of Israel there. They were going to be witness to the direction of the Lord. It goes down and down and, you know, and he, he says it's Saul, Saul of Kish. It's the man who's head and shoulders higher than anybody, taller than anybody in the land. And he, he says, come, Saul, come. And Saul doesn't come. And they find out that Saul's back. King James says he's hiding among the stuff. That means that there was baggage that had been brought in. People didn't just walk halfway across Israel without baggage or carts or, you know, there was every, every time there was a big meeting, there was stuff. And he was hiding in the stuff. You, you know, he was hiding in the baggage. And loved ones, you have to take this to the Lord because this isn't a Bible verse um, with, with, that clearly means this. This is a Bible verse that the Lord was using to illustrate to me what he was saying. And he said, I want my people to know that I need a people who will stop being so self-absorbed and self-aware and so concerned about themselves and their own welfare that they stop hiding among their baggage. And I knew exactly what he was saying. He wasn't talking about suitcases and trunks. He was saying, now these are my words, the enemy has done such a masterful job of making us feel like it's, it, it, what matters more than anything is that we're happy and that we are fulfilled. And, you know, it, it is said that upwards of 88% of abortions that occur 
are for medical reasons and almost 95% of the medical reasons, these statistics can change from year to year, but at one point it was 95% of the, the health of the mother was that so she wouldn't be stressed with a baby. And we have become a generation, I'm, I'm not condemning you, I'm just saying we have become so consumed with being sure we get the time off we need being sure that we have the financial goals met, being sure that we have career goals met, that we're saying, I'll sacrifice the life of a child. And loved ones, it's that attitude that causes us to hide among the stuff. So many of us are hiding among our baggage. You know, pastors will do that. They'll, they'll hide among their baggage of past hurts. They'll hide among the baggage of whatever, and the flock goes off to wander on its own. Dads will say, I've got baggage. My dad didn't treat me right. So he'll leave his home and make a single mom out of the woman that he promised to never leave. And, and, and we, you know, we, we do that in so many areas. And if I'm hearing God correctly, you have to decide if I am. But if I'm hearing God correctly, the number one thing he said we need to start with is understanding that we've got to stop hiding in our stuff. Life's not fair to me. I've never met anybody that life was fair to. Now, there are some people that had some golden moments. And I wish I'd had some golden moments like they had. But life's not fair. You say, well, well, it ought to be. It ought to be, but we messed up. It's called the fall of man. It's called sin and rebellion. I, I tell you, um, I, I've never thought about asking Dawn Staley to come preach here. I don't know what her theology is, but she preached a great sermon a couple of years ago, Coach Staley did. I like her. She said, someone asked her what the biggest challenge with coaching young adults was. And she said, well, somebody needs to tell our young adults that there, is a stat there ought to be a statute of limitations on how long you can blame your parents <laughs> for everything that has screwed up your life. <laughs> now, guys, I know there are some of us in here, there are some of us in here and you say, Pastor, I am screwed up, and it was my parents' fault. I know, I, I know. Hey, I'm not minimizing that. The, when, a, when a loved one, an authority figure violates uh, integrity and you're, you're molested uh, sexually or something else happens, I, I'm, I'm not minimizing that. I'm not saying, oh, just forget it. But I'm saying you have to do this. You have to realize you got stuff, you got baggage, but if you're going to serve, you got to get out of the baggage. Even if you have somebody else help you deal with it later, you got to get out of the baggage. And a generation is at stake because we are developing parents that think their welfare is the most important thing in their lives. And we need to go back to a radical biblical thought that children are your reward and children are your heritage and children are your legacy. You've seen a, a mother that weighs 97 pounds stand up to a bully that weighs 250 pounds because that bully is threatening her child. You see that in nature all the time. Loved ones, I'm not saying we need to go after people, but we need to learn to be protectors all over again. What do you say? In this present time, let's reclaim our families. Let's reconnect with our spouse. And let's re surround our children with our arms. <laughs> I saw a picture the other day. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, it's the picture of a little dog 
just barking, just barking, while his dad is just sitting behind him with his paw around front. So you've got this 85-pound dad, and you've got probably a 10-pound pup, and the pup is just barking away. And then you open it up, and it says, dads make you feel brave. And I thought, that's what dad should do. I don't know how to end this because I have a great ending, but it's, it's, it's way back on the last page. <laughs> so this is how I want to end. As always, the Lord deals with lives every week. And every week, people encounter the Holy Spirit making a claim for the Lordship of Jesus. As always, if you want to give your life to the Lord, please come. Please come. Whether you're in Brown Chapel, here in the sanctuary, or at home, There'll be a number on your screen that you can call. But loved ones, I don't know what your altar over your children will look like. I don't know. And, and this is about more than children because not all of you have children. But you are a protector over someone else. Or you're part of a network. You're somebody's favorite auntie. Or you're somebody's stepdad. Or you, I mean, the, the list goes on and on there's an application that can be made. You've got to decide where the application is made. But loved ones, I, I, I want you to know the foundational thing that we do, don't let a false foundation system, a false root system, lull you into thinking kids are out of danger when they're not. Let's find out what God wants us to do to just reestablish. You say, well, it's, you know, it's too late. My kids are grown. You know what I found? I found that kids are more hungry for restoration in their adult years than they are in their childhood years. They need it in the childhood years, but they understand what's happened in their older years. And loved ones, don't write your child off as, oh, it's too late just because they're grown. That's not the way it works. Oh, I could go on and on. Father, please help us. Help us to know where to draw the line. Some of our relationships are in danger of just being smothered. Some of our relationships are in danger of being swallowed whole. Some of those we love are in danger of being poisoned in a way that will either take their lives or take their destiny away from them. I'm asking you for an old-fashioned revival, not just of prayer in the altar. I'm asking you, Lord, to help us to go back and make right what we can make right. Help us to do our best. If, if restoration's impossible, don't let it be because of us. Help us to reclaim our children and our families and understand what real legacy is from the Lord. We want to have our, our uh, pavilion meals. We want to have our testimonies. We want to have our fellowship. We want to sing songs. But, oh, God, we want it, our children to be in our shadow as we do it. We don't want to farm them out to something else. Father, take the poison out of children or grandchildren that we might have called stupid or losers or punks or whatever the name we chose could have been. Father, take the toxicity out of that child. Help us to go to them if we've done that and pull it back. Help us to be willing to pull back what we can and commit to you what we cannot. Father, I ask for those that are sick or have other needs, we want to pray for them too. Lord, the, the needs are so diverse here today. So diverse. Mother's Day, like Father's Day, stirs up so many emotions, good, bad, and ugly. With all of this, Lord, it's, it's like we're in a spiritual snow globe with stuff just floating all around us. Lord, will you help us not to get distracted by the debris? 
but will you help us go to the heart of the matter? In Jesus' name.